Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the session 2 personal feedback presentation, Jesus gives personal feedback regarding measuring progress, the personal responsibility to seek for truth, attitudes towards the deconstruction of codependent addictions, God's viewpoint of good and bad compared to the world's, and real prayers. Recorded on the 25th of May, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. All right, well, what, what I'm going to do with this uh, f feedback session, so I'll just better, better write that on the board, just let me do that. <laughs> So this is a personal personal feedback session. Okay. Perhaps uh, could I have a mic with Ben again because I just wanted to finish some of his so whoever has got the mic this time if we could uh, just put your hand up for Ben and um, and if I could have a mic with him, I just wanted to finish off answering your question, which is about you know how you were worried that now all you muck, what I said mucked up all your <laughs> all of your thoughts. It took me three years of crying about the exact same thing that you've cried that you cry about, you know about about. The, w the women when they go on thinking that you might have lost them or whatever before I realized that I was on the wrong track so what I wanted to say to you was even though it feels a bit confronting when I'm saying it to you now I'm actually saving you quite a few years of processing I've actually been doing that for a lo lot of years already actually <laughs> and that's what I learned is after a few years I realized there was no change occurring and when there's no change occurring, that tells you you're in an emotion of self-delusion. I, I did that with my girlfriend when I was 21. Yeah, yeah. And this is, a, this is something that I've had to learn in my processing is that if I process emotion sincerely and, and I'm crying and, I'm, and I think I'm releasing but there's no change actually occurring in my life, then it means I'm not actually processing anything. I'm just crying about something in, a, in an addiction, in a self-delusion. Even though you get that nice feeling afterwards that you've released something, it's not really... Yeah, the key, is, key, there's two things that are going to give you feedback about whether you are changing. One, one is that you have a feeling of release. The second, though, and more importantly, is that the law of attraction changes. <laughs> That you that your attract your life changes afterwards. Now, if your life doesn't change afterwards, it means you haven't processed anything. God's laws are consistent. You know, this is something that we need to really understand. That God's laws are consistent. If there is an actual change in your soul, then there'll be an actual change in your environment. If there's no actual change in your environment, then there'll be no actual change. Then there was no actual change in your soul. So I was thinking in a situation like that, that it, it wouldn't have been like a really core issue. So fear of them not coming home wouldn't I wouldn't be able to work out what the change would be from something like that. But there's a change for everything. The fact that you've been crying. When was the first time you cried about this? When? You were 21? Yeah, 20, so 20 years ago. Yeah. How old are you now? 20, 40, 40, 43. 43. Yeah. So 22 years ago you first cried about it and you're still crying about it. That's the answer. It means that it's not an actual emotion of pain that exists in you but rather an emotion driven by some self-delusions and, and addictions. You follow me? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and this is... Uh, it, it, it took me years to work out what the difference was and my, after a while I started to see that unless there was an immediate change of some kind in my life, then it meant that I hadn't dealt with that particular thing. 
whatever I thought, and whatever I thought I was dealing with was probably just uh, self-delusion of some kind or some kind of um, uh, where I was in an addiction, allowing an emotion that my parents had allowed me to feel anyway. Because I went home the other day after you said um, about Angel riding her bike and I went, well, gee, that's easy, that's not a problem. I'll just do that for everything. But it's not... No, you've still got to do this, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah, really no, important. I, I was away. I was just going <laughs> to... <laughs> yeah, so easy to misinterpret some things and off you go, thinking you're on the bill. And, you know, if you think about, for many of you, I have given you plenty of indication you're not on the right track, but you often ignore what I say. So um, that's okay, you know. I'll keep saying it. <laughs> and again, be, be careful with what you say, that it's very specific to what to the, what you're actually discussing with that person. Correct. It's not a general... Correct. And also you've got to remember that uh, um, what many of you try to do is, it's really interesting, we discuss a individual problem and then you try to globally apply it, but, but you very rarely ask about principles that apply globally. So I find that really interesting. It's like you, you get an individual thing that we've discussed and apply it globally, but you very rarely ask a question about things that do apply globally. Uh, so I find that interesting. It demonstrates to a degree how a lack of logic exists in our soul relating to emotion because of, the, because of these primary problems, you know, the desensitization to the real problems and the desensitization to terror and and what we do in that place you know we, we do a lot of things in that place yeah, and that's that feeling not confusion but like this disjointed yeah like so you went away from that one discussion thinking you had everything licked and that's the problem is that we often want to go away from one discussion thinking we've got everything licked, everything sorted. And, and it's not like that. And you've got to give up this sort of magical thinking that it, every problem's generally quite unique and has specific areas to it, uh, things to it, you know, that need to be deconstructed. And, yeah, so it's very important to see that. Yeah. Anyway, what I'd like to do is proceed now with some of these questions. There's only a few on here, but there's a few I'd like to answer now. And then when we get to the group feedback, that will answer some of the others. Does that make sense? So, um, oh, can we start with you, Sam? And uh, if we have Sam, the mic over there, and um, where's he gone? Oh, there he is, Alan. Sorry, you haven't moved. So, um, and Al, Alan, the mic there. You've basically asked the same question, so I'm going to start with Sam and then come to Alan about that. Sam, uh, you said, I'd like some guidance around what is my biggest block to feeling my global terror. A very interesting question. You're actually displaying your biggest block in your question with me. Addiction to validation from men. <sighs> yes. Whenever, you, whenever any of you use the term, please tell me my biggest block, you know what you're doing? You're putting the responsibility of your progress on my shoulders. That's what you're doing. And I'm not responsible for you to find your biggest block. And I was really trying to find the way to word it so that it didn't feel like that, but <laughs> <laughs> obviously you can feel it no matter what. Me yeah. too. And, Alan, and Alan's done the same thing. So Alan says, what is my biggest block I have about accepting my facade? You're now putting responsibility on a man, same problem, putting responsibility on a man to rescue you from having to do your own work. I find these questions difficult to answer, to be honest, because it, there's so much addiction in them that, that I have to first focus on the addiction. And secondly, it is your responsibility to find your blocks, you know, and not somebody else's. And whenever you're asking other people to tell you your blocks, no matter what condition they're in, 
you're actually placing respons responsibility on them to do so. So I much rather ask, answer a question that says, I've discovered that I have this particular problem. What can I do about that? Is much better to answer than just tell me what my biggest problem is. Because when you say, tell me what the biggest problem is, you're actually demonstrating that you've not even sought to discover it. Do you see what I'm saying? You're not, you've not, you're not seeking. And so when I read a question like that, and we get quite a lot of these kind of questions, as you can imagine, um, my first feeling is this person is not seeking. They are already in their addiction to have me tell them rather than seek for themselves what the issue is. Does that make sense? So for yourself, Sam, you see there's this man thing. The very thing we discussed in your previous question, if you think about it, before the break, um, is the very addiction you're actually engaged in here. Yeah, I can see how just about every single addiction, every part of my facade almost relates back to this compulsion to get this validation yeah about you know this feeling like i want to avoid how terrible i feel about myself yeah um and yeah i think that that was the only form of positive validation i got in my early childhood so yeah. you also don't realize that it's been a major draw for, for you and rick to have a relationship because he has a feeling inside of himself of uh, self-assuredness and you like that. You like a man who feels self-assured. And if you think back to other men that you've been attracted to, you probably find it's very similar. There's this self-assured feeling that they have, that they know what's right, that they're doing the, you know, they, they think they do anyway. It's probably the, the only man I've been with that I've that I have a lot of respect for, and, and that's probably a part of it. Yeah. 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 Yep. Okay. So, and for yourself, Alan, um, you can see same issue. You're wanting a man, do the same thing for you. Yep. So this is uh, wanting man, somebody to do the work for you, wanting a man to do the work for you. You not having to do the work yourself. It's a it's a very big addiction that we have of not wanting somebody not wanting to do the work ourselves and in fact it's quite a lot uh, there's quite a lot of anger in it quite a lot of anger towards god in it too in that why isn't god damn well telling me you know what do i have to go and find out for yeah i can feel <coughs> uh, with my relationship with my physical father that i never really got any understanding on him or myself in yeah. my childhood yeah and i can see that i projected that onto you to yeah. go well you help me understand myself more yeah. and that way i don't have to feel as much yeah responsibility and, and pain and can you see the ju the it's almost like you're trying to get out of having to do some emotional things yourself yeah yeah and, and this is why it's a struggle to hear god for you yeah. Because God doesn't want you to get out of feeling your emotion. God wants you to get into it. Yeah. And also God wants you to take personal responsibility for that process rather than giving responsibility away to somebody else. I've done it with women as well. You have. Yeah. It's yep. from both parents. I can feel. Yep. I'm, I'm starting to get open to well, it, it actually really exists in me where the New Age stuff I studied, they said, don't worry about that. You can move on because you're unique and there's no one else as beautiful as you. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about that. Just f focus on your passions. Yeah. And I did a lot of that for 20 years. Yeah. And now I'm, I've realised I've been carrying a, a semi-trailer behind me. I didn't even know it was invisible. Yeah. 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 Trying to carry all this burden while at the same time engaging your passions is pretty hard. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's been – It's I've aged a lot because of that yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 So, so this, again, an illustration of some addiction in play and the comfort satisfaction comes from the male giving you the validation you want and telling you what your block is. And then you feel like, oh, now I haven't had to discover it myself. I'll, I'll just trust that and hope it's r true, you know. And, and, and fortunately, it means that you place too much trust in men around you. So for both okay. of you, that's the case. So um, I find that what com comes up for me a lot is not knowing what to focus on. Like I feel yeah. like I get shown all these single event emotions through the law of attraction. 
Um, but then I kind of go, no, I just need to focus on faith and now I need to focus on my blocks to receiving God's love. And and so am I just creating that confusion because I don't really want to know what the, yeah. Okay. We In this place where we're avoiding that, we, we want confusion. We want to go from one thing to the other thing, the other thing, the other thing, because it, it helps us avoid the fact that we're terrified. And the biggest thing you could do is actually experience your terror. Um, but, you know, you've asked what's the block towards feel, feeling your terror. Well, one of your blocks is this addiction to having the man make you feel less terrified. Yep. The man, the okay. man, man makes you feel like you're not alone. You're not, you know, you, you've got someone to help you with doing it, that kind of thing. Mm. Does it make sense? Yeah, it does. And, um, and, that, and that makes you feel less terrified and therefore it, it takes you away from feeling that emotion. Yeah, it's not actually supporting me in it at all. It's keeping me away from it. It's That's right. Me yeah, addiction. That's yeah. the irony of it. And in case of, of, of yourself, our same kind of thing, it takes you away from feeling terrified that you're alone, terrified that you've got to make these decisions and you work things out for yourself. And, and, and there is this underlying feeling that maybe you are alone and there's no God and no one's helping you. And, you know, and, and it's so, that, so me giving you that feedback that you want actually um is actually taking you away from going in the direction where i feel you need to go so it's actually yeah. counter counter counterproductive yeah that makes sense yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank I, you. I feel that uh, there's so much wonderful information that you've given us and you're trying to streamline it and help us because you can see where we're at and then i i feel sometimes that Oh, now I'm going to have to begin again and, and learn it all again. And, and that's when I can start. I've noticed recently that I'm leaning towards Diana or another person to, to get some information so, I, so it's easier for me. It's like, yeah, it's almost like I'm, I'm making it harder by not feeling the next step sort of thing. Yeah. Well, see, a lot of this is, a, is our resistance to self responsibility. Do you, do you see? It's like um, we 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 have a lot of times parents wanted our dependency. Do, do you follow? They they des in fact in many cases many parents desperately need our dependency, even for the rest of our lives, mm. because that validates their role as the, pe the parent. It tells them that they are a good mm. parent. They'll come to your rescue whenever you need to be rescued, and so forth and so forth. But the problem with that is it sets up so many codependent addictions with our parents. Mm. And, and in that, one of the addictions too happens to be then that we, that we feel like no personal sense of responsibility for development of ourselves, where we're reliant on other people assisting our development or assisting us in everything we do. Mm. And this is where I see many of you are... It, it, uh, very bad with engaging your your passions, mm. because you want somebody else to come along with you for the ride, mm. even if yeah. it's even if it's just to validate that that passion is a good passion. Yeah, but you're dependent upon somebody telling you that it's good, and somebody somebody saying encouraging you, and somebody wanting you to do it, wanting to do it even with you, you know, and 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 then when nobody does do that. Um, then you sort of throw your arms up in the air or get angry with the people who don't do it or throw your arms up in the air and say, well, it's no good me doing it then uh, because you're doing it alone and you're going alone and it makes you feel like you're alone. Mm. And that's some of the feelings that you're sort of denying in that process. Um, so you remember that these are holes in the, uh, the addictions begin with the painful hole and we desperately want the addiction to fulfil the hole. Well, we want the addiction to make us feel better about that whole being there and to make the whole sort of appear like it's not there anymore. And and this is why when, when you ask me just a very basic question about what is the block, you're basically placing the burden on me to feel you and then to feel what your block is and then to regurgitate what I can feel from you in a language that I feel you might understand. That's that's what you're doing to me. and. And while I, you know, have engaged that in the past many times, um, I feel less uh, like to, likely to do it now because I just feel like all I'm doing is making this global fear and making the fear of this pain mm. and, and also causing you to become dependent mm. um, 
And I don't want you to be dependent. Mm. You're not. You're not my dependents. Mm. You're. You're like my brothers and sisters. You, we. We are. Uh, we have the ability to create together, uh, but but the reality is, you are responsible for your own life and the choices you're making, and I'm not responsible for those choices. Mm. And what I'm trying to do is encourage you to desire from within one yourself, and develop within yourself the aspiration to address these particular issues. So that's why nowadays I sort of look at questions like that and I go, well, what I'd prefer to see as a question is, I have identified this as a major problem that I've got, which means that you've actually done some personal work to identify what those particular issues are. And then if you need some help, uh, how do I, I'm still a bit confused about how to go about feeling this, what can I do? To me, that's sort of like a more interesting question to answer because it means the person has done some work. They've, they've, they've engaged their will and they've had to take some self-responsibility. Does that make sense? Yep. 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 Okay, that's good. That's good questions because of what I can illustrate in the answer. <laughs> um, Um, can we go to Th Thalia, um, if you just put your hand up. Now, I'll answer the first part of your question, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. You've got deconstructing a facade. How do you destroy a codependent addiction with a parent in a loving way? Right? I, I, the question is interesting because you, it's almost suggesting that you, can, that you can destroy a codependent addiction with a parent in an unloving way. <laughs> but the reality is the codependent addiction with a parent is unloving. <laughs> so so any way you destroy it is going to be more loving than having the addiction itself. Yes. Do you see what yep. I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so we, we need to see, it's almost like, we, we almost go like this sometimes. We, we almost say to ourselves, um, I've got a codependent addiction, but it's not that bad. How can, I, how can I get rid of it in a loving manner? Well, when I go, I feel like going, no, the codependent addiction is unloving. The, you know, like, yeah, yeah. just to try to drum it in. The codependent addiction is unloving. Like, any way you destroy it, it's going it. to be better <laughs> than, yeah. than that. So, so I, th I think, firstly, that's the thing you need to see. Okay. Any, any way that you destroy a codependent addiction is going to be better and more loving than the way than keeping it there, mm. right, so that yep. that's number one. Number two is that uh, obviously it requires you working through your end of the addiction. Mm -hmm. When you work through your end of the addiction, it really doesn't matter what the other person does. Right? They can still project to you they want things from you, but you won't deliver them. Now, they will get angry and frustrated and annoyed with you and probably yell at you and not want to see you and find somebody else to give their addiction or whatever they choose to do. Or they may have a breakthrough and they may realise they were out of harmony with love too and work through their addiction. Who knows what they'll do? But you don't have any choice or, or, or control over their response to you addressing your part of the addiction. So the way you really lovingly deal with a codependent addiction is you only address your part of it. But what I see the majority of people doing, particularly in relationships, is they go, you're doing this with me, you're doing this with me. You want the other person to make yeah. the changes that you're unwilling to make yourself, right? And that is a very unloving thing to do. Because basically what you're trying to do then is trying to get them to adjust their projection at you without you having to deal with your projection back to them, your desire or demand on them. So the way you lovingly address a codependent addiction is by addressing your side of the addiction and not worrying about how the other person responds or reacts or punishing the other person for their response or reaction to you removing your part of the addiction. 
Makes yep. sense. Makes sense. Yep. Good question. Okay, Rita. Where's Rita? Can I just? Uh, um, good question, Rita. Does a bad person in quotations have less facade than a good person in quotations? And is the bad person living less of a lie? So it's really, or is the bad person living less of a lie? And so has a greater potential of change. It's an interesting question, isn't it? And the um, the question, um, if I can just write a few things on the board about this question: whose definition of bad and whose definition of good? Yeah, I wrote good and bad in. Um, I, un it, I understand. In advertis commas. Yeah, to no, say I understand. I'm not criticizing the question. Yeah, the world's it's definition of good and bad. Thinking I am. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to shorten it and not... No, no, no. You, again, you're justifying okay, something that I you. haven't even criticised. Thank you. So there's a problem there with one of your addictions, my girl. Thank you. So bad. Let's look at it from God's perspective. What, what's bad? Well, it's sin. So what's sin? Unloving from whose God's perspective? Or if we be more specific, breaking God's laws. So it's a person who breaks God's laws. Right? And a good person is? One who is in society seen as good. Uh, also, uh, a person well, let's look who at it from God's follows God's laws. God, yeah, from God's perspective, it's a perfect person because they... they in harmony, harmony with God's, with God's laws. laws. Yeah. Okay, so if we look at it from that perspective and then we ask the question again this time oh, just not myself out. Does a bad person have less facade as a good than a good person? Well, if we, if we look at it from God's perspective and God's definition of a bad person, well, obviously the bad person has the most facade. Is that not true? And the good person has no facade. Right? But, but the question, as, as you pointed out, Rita, is not about God's perspective here, is it? So we just brought a line across there. And now let's look at it from human perspective. So what's bad from a human perspective? A criminal. Sorry? A, a criminal or a person who hits their children. Yeah, let's define it really more closely. Remember yesterday I drew a line across the board and I said that's society's definition of love. A bad person from a human perspective is anyone who's under that line. <laughs> Isn't it? All right. So that's classified as a bad person. Someone that society feels is lower than them in terms of their condition of love. And what does society treat as a good person? Someone who's just slightly above. <laughs> Isn't that true? Just slightly above society's definition of a normal person. Because if you get too far above it, then you're a bad person again. <laughs> so that's a good person. That's a bad person. And that's a bad person. Yeah, very confusing. So you can be too good and therefore be bad. <laughs> A bit tricky, huh? So here we go. This society's definition of love. Maybe I should just draw that in a different... I'll draw that as a wavy line here just so you can see that clearly. And then what's good and what's bad from society's perspective. Now... In answer to your question properly, Rita, basically anybody that society believes is good or bad is full of addiction and facade. So I thought a person who is bad 
in their soul has also good things, but they act on the bad things on their, in their soul. And yes. a good person... Yeah, just stop for a moment so I can explain to everyone. So now what Rita's really saying is that this person is using their will, though, aren't they? Yeah. They're yeah. using their will in a strong way against society's run-of-the-mill you know, norm. So they do have a developed will. It's just in a bad direction. And sometimes those people do find it easier to progress because they've already engaged the use of their will. Does that make sense? But, but, it, but it's highly likely they have a pretty big facade still. It's just that the only difference is the use of their will. Does that make sense? So it's really a, not a question about facade. It's more of a question about will. This person here who's defined as bad by society is using their will against society and often getting punished for it. So, so they've obviously got a fairly strong will to, to go ahead and do that. Or they have a very strong feeling of rebellion. Uh, it could just be a strong will. It could be just a very strong feeling of rebellion against society. This good person here obviously is using their will but within the accepted society norm. In other words, they're not going too good. It's just within the accepted society norm. Highly likely they have a fairly high facade, isn't it? Because they are still within the parameters of the society norm. right? This person up here who's now gone bad because he's really good. <laughs> it's really confusing. This person here has had to use their will in a loving manner, haven't they? So they have now begun to understand the use of their will in a loving manner, but unfortunately society now deems them to be outside of the norm. And therefore this person here who's bad it's actually got the least facade. So can you see it just depends on where they are when it hits the society's norm as to how they're viewed. And that's why it's very confusing. You know, with God it's just it's very simple. Break God's laws, you're a sinner, that's bad. And, and he's not saying the person is bad, is he? Because he still loves the person. He's just saying their actions are bad, they're wrong, they're out of harmony with love. And here he's not saying the person themselves is good, like in the sense that God believes that every person is good. God created every person to be good, right? But the good person is the perfect person is the person who brings their life in harmony. So this person, as this person continues to use their will to progress towards God's view of good, from society's point of view, they'll probably get worse. <laughs> Right. Until society themselves see the benefit of what that person is doing. Right. And that may take years, hundreds of years, thousands of years, it will never happen. So we can't rely on society eventually saying, oh, you're a lovely person, no matter what you've chosen to do. Hmm. Yeah, I thought it was an interesting question. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay. If you use a microphone, Dave. Remember, we've got an audience aside from the audience here. And you're a prime example of that. Well, I don't know if I'm a prime example of that, but. <laughs> I mean, as in, you know, getting <coughs> I'm more. Trying loving. to be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yep. Okay. Ah, oh, Deidre. Where is she? Down the front here. So we just come to Deidre. This is the last personal one I'll answer. Very good question, Deidre. Because of what I'm going to say as an answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I struggle to write the question, as you can see. <laughs> yeah. How do I pray for help to do something I don't want to do? <laughs> Re like, honestly, most of you are doing this. You're praying for help for something that you don't really want to do. Is it a prayer? No. no. 
It's not a prayer. So we can't use the word pray. Yeah, yeah. Can we? So no. there's two answers to this. One is, how do I pray for help to do something I don't want to do? Well, you can't. <laughs> Simple as that. You can pray for uh, help to develop the aspiration to do it. Yeah, because this morning I, I think for the first time I'm starting to realise that my refusal to feel my pain is actually a choice I've made. So if I've Correct. made that soul-based choice, well, I can make another one. You can. And I can make it like I will develop faith in a good God. Yes. And I can do that. So I was, yeah, I was, like you say, I was struggling to find the answers. I, I understand. Yeah, yeah. It's a good question because how do I pray for help to do something I don't want to do? The reality is a prayer is about what you want to do not about what you don't want to do. And, and like, obviously, if you don't want to do something, that is your prayer. I don't want to do it. Don't let me do it. Don't let me have to do it. And God's not going to answer that prayer if what you're asking God to not do is out of harmony with God's laws. So God's not going to do it. So what you won't. Those kind of prayers very rarely answered, very rarely answered. And that's why the average person says, you know, don't let me fall in love with that person that I think I'm falling in love with. Um, <laughs> doesn't get answered, you know, or that per person that says, um, you know, don't let me get tempted by whatever, mm. you know, that prayer is rarely answered because, you know, they obviously want to be tempted by that thing. You know. Yeah, and I was more wanting to know, well, if, I'm, if I've realised I've made this decision, then more like how do I then unravel? The well, the first thing you've got to realise is that your actual prayer is that you don't want to do it. That's number one. So Recognise yeah. your facade is, I don't want to do it. So you're now being honest, and this is one thing I do love about you, is you're pretty honest <laughs> about the fact you don't want to do things, right? And, the, and that, that, that is quite good because it means that we've got a point that we can begin at where you do accept the truth, and that is you don't want to do it. That's, yeah. your tr that's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's wonderful because it means that you've cut away some of your facade doing that, right? So that's good. That's step number one. You've got to get to the stage where you, f you feel, you know that you actually feel you don't want to, right? Yeah. So you've got to allow yourself to not want to. Okay. Can you see that? That's what you're doing. You're accepting your facade by allowing yourself to see that I really just don't want to do this, right? And then comes the question. I know it's good for me if I did do it. Yes. <laughs> right. So, then, so then it gets a bit. Okay, doesn't know he's going. And so what we what we need to do then is we go. Okay, if I know it's good for me that I do it, but I still don't want to do it. Yeah. Then obviously there's some there's going to have to be something developed, which allows me to transition between not wanting to, and wanting to. You yeah. follow me? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Now, this question was answered in, it, when Graham Sutherland asked the question in the first uh, series of presentations, the, the first course, you know. And what I said to him is you need to develop an aspiration to do the good thing. Yes, yeah, so I've just got to want to want to. Is that what you kind of mean? You No, know, you've got to do some work to develop a desire to want to. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and how do you develop a desire of any kind? Yeah. You think about how you develop a desire of any kind. You first, uh, you know, face yourself with the truth of it. You face, so in this case, you'd face yourself with the truth of what the bad thing is creating. You'd face yourself with the truth of what the good thing might create. The second thing you need to do is you need to have some faith. So you'd have to develop some faith that if you do the good thing, there will be a good result. Because if you feel there's no good result, you won't do it. So you have to have some faith, and that means developing some faith. How do you develop faith? Well, you've got to start testing and uh, experimenting with God's laws so, so that you can work out, well, if I do a good thing, do I, is there rewards for doing a good thing? Right? And what are those rewards? And, that, and some of the rewards are not instant. Some of the rewards are long-term, like... Spirit-based rewards. When you hit the spirit world, that's where you get a lot of the rewards. Unfortunately, the rewards on earth are less tangible because the majority of society is working against you doing the good thing. Mm. So therefore, the reward is less tangible. 
But, but you can observe other people who have engaged that same behaviour and look at their life and look at their happiness and see, ask yourself whether that's the kind of happiness you'd like. That's a part of building the faith. So once you've built some faith, then you can build an aspiration to do the thing you don't want to do. And, and an aspiration is all about getting to the point of seeing the reason why it, it could be done and getting to the point where you really want to do it. And that requires education of yourself on what is it going to achieve, what benefits are you going to get from doing it, and those kind of things. So it's a process that you need to go to. It's not a magical thing that's going to come along. Your aspiration isn't going to come along without a development of it inside of yourself. Yeah, and I, I realise that faith is like <coughs> developing faith is like the number one. Thing. Yeah, at this stage you've got very little faith in, and this is the source of a lot of your anger, mm -hmm. uh, is that you don't feel a very strong faith that God is going to reward any good action. You know. Or even good at this point. Sorry? Or even good at this point. Although a little bit, but mm. yeah, mm. if I'm honest. Yeah. 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 And so that's a good place to start and then it's a matter of developing an aspiration to change that. Mm. Right? Yeah. No, that's good. Thank you. That's good. good okay, that's good. Okay. So that is the end of the personal feedback session. Thank <laughs> you.